in preparation for prayer. And uh, so this is blue sage and a lot of women, you can see it, it's a beautiful um, little herb. It's an herb and it grows very well in uh, Southern Ontario and in Quebec in some places, but not in all places. So what I do with this is that I will, it's, it's referred to in the indigenous community as a smudge. Um, I guess you can probably say, you know, that when people use incense, they burn, they burn it to uh, make their space, their home, wherever they may be, uh, ready for prayer. So I'd like to begin, and I would like to, um, for some reason, I'm really thinking about my old friend Patricia Locke this evening, who, of course, uh, had a lot to do with education across the United States, and I know this was, is one of the areas that the Americans are beginning to um, look into is the residential school fallout, if you will. So I'm, I'm thinking of Pat tonight, and anybody that you're thinking of that needs prayers, that needs um, a phone call, somebody who's lonely, somebody who's not well, um, yeah, let's send out our prayers to all those people. And I'd like to say a prayer for the remover of difficulties, which of course was given to us by His Holiness, the Bob, who's the forerunner of Baha'u'llah, the blessed Bob. And it'll be in my language, which is in the Northern Toshone language from the Nacho Nayakdan people, the big river people of Northeastern Yukon. So I know you can't smell this, but if you could, it's a very pleasant smell, very pleasant. I'd like to offer this prayer for all of our ancestors from wherever on the planet they're from. Let us remember, for without our ancestors, we would not be here. The Janet Niu Tauringi Ukanu Jigedia Hajuyata Nedru Nakashu Agio Tauringi Klahuagi the Tatniki Keaki Ayugi Natsa Natsa Dayats Acho Natsa Ali Thank you so much for sending us this beautiful blessing of this much. I can I can smell the sage over Zoom already. Um, this is a beautiful way of starting, opening up for um, our site tonight. And I thank uh, Louise. Um, the I just want to go through a quick, quick, uh, quick guidelines to the friends that I see today and new faces, new friends. Um, welcome all to our Fireside community. And uh, so this community Fireside runs weekly, every Thursday from seven to eight. And um, if you like to be uh, receiving or emails, uh, I know that for Sunday sends out emails for the upcoming topic and guest speakers, please, uh, Send us your email address on the chat box, um, and then um, Forzani will make sure that she, you know, we be able to include you to uh, any upcoming uh, Farsight uh, topic coming up. And also to, if I may ask everyone to respectfully stay on mute throughout this uh, beautiful topic talk from Louise, and uh, to only unmute yourself when it is question period. Uh, 
I believe, and I'm sure there will be questions at the end. Everyone will get a chance. So if you do have a question to please send, put your name down either in the box, or you can also use the hand raised um, emoji. And then I will make sure that I can get through everyone's name so they can have a chance to uh, talk and, and share any insights or any questions um, mm -hmm. for everyone here. And uh, not to, to keep us any longer, um, I would love to formally now um, introduce our wonderful uh, esteemed guest speaker, Louise Prophet LeBlanc. Thank you. Thank you so much for being among us tonight. Um, you are not just a guest, but you are a sister among us, um, if I may say that. And uh, so Louise um, will be talking about how to remain calm in the storm and that the future of Canada is great. Very uplifting and uh, hope, message of hope tonight that we're we're seeing in the title. Um, Louise, uh, she shares with us what each of us can do in the journey to reconciliation and how we can unite and heal our family. Louise's traditional name is, um, and forgive me if I am not <laughs> saying it correctly, say Ito? Yes. Okay. Yes. And she is from the Nacho Nayak Dun First Nation in Northeastern Yukon. She previously worked as the Indigenous Arts Con Coordinator for the Canada Council for the Arts with the primary responsibility to expand and improve access to granting programs for Indigenous artists and to increase cultural awareness. She now travels the world as a cultural ambassador and enjoys, enjoys sharing her own artistic talents as a traditional storyteller, keeper, writer, speaker, textile artist, poet, and mentor for the younger generations. So at the bottom of my heart, thank you, Louise, for being tonight uh, to, to bring us a message of unity, healing, and hope. And I yield the floor to you. Masi. And so I say thank you in my language, Masi Cho. Indian Duhuti, I greet you in my language. And Indian Dohoti means, how's the world treating you? And usually the response is Sothan. In the indigenous language of the Nacho Nayak Dan, um, it is a teaching that you do not, uh, I suppose you could say, you do not contest with God. If God wants to give you rain, he'll give you rain. If he wants to give it, he'll give it. If he wants to make it very hot, that will also happen. And of course, we are tested in our lives by many, many things. And those tests are good for us. So when I first you know, realized, came into my own understanding of the prayers for tests is not to alleviate those tests, but to grow from them. So then I understood the concept in our language, Indian Dohoti, and you say Sothan. That means everything is good. So even if we are suffering, even if we have to face great tests in our life, it's all for the good. So that's how I wanted to start out uh, this evening. And I really thank all of you for coming tonight and and I know that last week you had another um, discussion about what's going on in Canada with regards to the residential school and the findings of many of the precious remains of the children in these particular um, institutions uh, that have been around in Canada for well over a hundred years. I sent, uh, I sent a photograph, which I would like um, Farouz to put up, if she could. I want you to be introduced to my Auntie Molly. I guess we'll have to go back one or forward. Yeah, there she is. I don't know if you can make that, yeah. This is my Auntie Molly. Say hello to her. <laughs> 
as you can see, there's a, a mountain in the background, a hill, which is, uh, <clears throat> it's called the Dome. And it's behind the city of Dawson City in the Yukon. And she's five years old here. And she's in a residential school. And, and those days in Dawson City, they called it a mission school. And my father and his twin brother were also there. And um, my brother, my, uh, my father and his brother, of course, were the same age, and they were four years older than her. So naturally, as an older brother, uh, they felt responsible for taking care of her. So tonight, when we say prayers, we, uh, I would like us to also think about her because she's the one that encouraged me to have a ceremony, a special ceremony for all the children that they recently found. And I think for Ruz, you have three prayers. So Auntie Molly never came home. And my father was devastated when he realized that she was missing at the school. And he, when he told me about this, he was in his late 70s. And all his life, he carried that heartache that he was unable to help his sister. He was unable to save her. So I dedicate my work this year, this special year. Of course, this is a special year of the centenary of Abdul Baha. And you know how much Abdul Baha loved children. Children always kind of just were glommed onto him in all of the old photographs, as you can see. And so I dedicate my work to her this year. But before we do that, I've chosen three prayers. And who would like to say them? Maybe you uh, can put your hand up and we'll put them on the screen. These are prayers for children. Maybe Yasmin, you can say one of these prayers, please. Thank you. Did we get that? Sorry, where are the prayers? I sent the prayers to Farouz. Yeah, Bita, yeah, hold on. I'm just trying to, I'm just opening it up to share. Give me one sec. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Bita. Okay. So maybe Yasmin, you can share this first prayer. And I, 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 love, I love this prayer because it makes reference to an ego. He is God. O thou kind Lord, we are poor children needy and insignificant, yet we are plants which have sprouted by thy heavenly stream and saplings bursting into bloom in thy divine springtime. Make us fresh and verdant by the outpourings of the clouds of thy mercy. Help us to grow and develop through the rays of the sun of thy goodly gifts and cause us to be refreshed by the quickening breeze wafting from the meadows of truth. Grant that we may become flourishing trees laden with fruit in the orchid of knowledge. Brilliant stars shining above the horizon of eternal happiness in radiant lamps shedding light upon the assemblage of mankind. O oh Lord, should thy tender care be vouchsafed unto us, each one of us would, even as an eagle, soar to the pinnacle of knowledge. But were we left to ourselves, we would be consumed away and would fall into loss and frustration. Whatever we are, from thee do we proceed, and before thy threshold do we seek refuge. Thou art the bestower, the bountiful, the all-loving. Abdul Baha. Thank you. I can say the next one if you'd like, Louise. Thank you, thank you. O oh Lord, guard thou the children that are born in thy day, are nurtured at the breast of thy love, and fostered in the bosom of thy grace. O oh Lord, 
They are verily young branches growing in the gardens of thy knowledge. They are boughs budding in thy groves of grace. Grant them a share of thy generous gifts. Make them to thrive and flourish in the rain that raineth from the clouds of thy bestowal. Thou art verily the generous, the clement, the compassionate. Thank you. Well, that's the same one that we had before. I must have chosen the wrong one, but that's fine. I think those two are so beautiful. <clears throat> okay. Well, the, <clears throat> the premise of uh, some of the things that I would like to speak to this evening are what do we do as people from a faith community? Because I don't know how many of you here are members of other religions or Baha'is, and it makes no difference. Every one of us has been affected in Canada by this very uh, tragic news. And what you're also discovering is that since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, after all of the testimonies were given, many Indigenous people knew that this would be the case. In fact, they shared their stories as I just shared about my father's sister, my auntie, that there were children who died at these schools. So it's very interesting that before the news broke, and I, and I spoke to a couple of my friends, they said that there was a feeling of heaviness at the end of May. And then when the news broke, we knew why. And what to do with this kind of news, especially in Canada. And I've been speaking also to teachers who have to share this with little children about what has happened. And of course, little children being curious as they are, and many of them frightened, ask the obvious question, why? And do you think I might be one of them? So this is why I really thought that we should consider how to remain calm in a storm. Calm for the children of today, all children. Calming, how to remain calming. So how do we do that when so many people haven't hugged for so long? Maybe just the people in your bubble, maybe just your family. You know, when people are, are grieving, and I think, I honestly feel that all of Canada is grieving collectively. And isn't it interesting that with Canada's station, I suppose you would refer to it as, Abdu Baha said the future of Canada is very great, both materially and spiritually. And that's a promise. Whatever Abdu Baha says will happen is happening. So we have to hang on to his exhortations and his, his words of prophecy that Canada, perhaps it's because of the smaller population we have, we are in a better condition or a better situation whereby we can have this world family right in our country and recognize that all people are one and we're all family. I also was thinking that this is a time and opportunity to also be cognizant of the tablets of the divine plan, which of course in 1914, when Abdu'l Baha had already visited America and Canada, he visited this small little area around Montreal, 
And then he went to the United States. He visited at the Maxwell House. I'm sure that many of you who are from Montreal who have traveled there have gone to the beautiful shrine where Abdu'l Baha lived. And that in the establishment of the Tablets of the Divine Plan, which he sent back to America, certain things were to happen. And one of the things, of course, is that people across the country would become more aware of the world because they were settled, settled in the United States. And so each of the different, you know, different states, different areas, he offered prayers for them so that they would be reminded. And I couldn't help but when I first read the Tablets of the Divine Plan, I was thinking to myself, he's referring to people, non-Indigenous people, about the preciousness of the place that they live now. And that particular place that they lived, whether it's in Nebraska or Idaho or Michigan, you know, Michigan means big lake. Big lake, Michigan, that means a big lake. And there's many uh, states that are indigenous names and people don't pay much attention to that, but I, I, I was always thinking about that. And then of course, you know, Abdul Baha turned the sod for the house of worship in Wilmette beside that big lake, Michigan. And I've tried to find out in my research, were there any indigenous people there? And I haven't been able to find solid evidence that there was um, people there. Although, um, uh, what's his name? Earl Redmond assures me that there was one individual there when the sod was being turned. Why do I say all these things? Because a land that was occupied for thousands of years by people who acknowledged all the nations of the world, although none of them had come to their shores, were praying for that prophecy to be fulfilled. That's so interesting for me to acknowledge that. And in the medicine wheel, you'll see there's the um, yellow is in the east, representing the Asian community of the world. The yellow represents children. In the south is the red, and this represents indigenous people. In the west is the black, representing the black community of the world. And in the top is the white. So the yellow represents children, little children brand new, new light to the world, just coming out, just growing. And then in the south for the red, this is the time of intellectual growing, uh, a lot of um, passion going on, becoming, becoming a young adult is the red. And then in the west, is the black and this black represents more of a solidity adulthood this is where you have to take all that energy from your adolescence your young and you have been preparing to be a parent become parents become responsible for your community so that's that the west represents that more of a, a calming period and then of course all of us with all this lovely white hair the northern sphere of the medicine wheel represents elders, represents those people who are caretakers of knowledge acquired from one's life and other relatives who are older than them, their lives. We have this huge accumulation and that's the pure sphere because you have one step in the next world. You know, this is always a this is always a wonderment for me when I lived with my grandmother. 
He said, yeah, you know, when you get really old, you know your next step is not going to require a shoe. Won't require a body. Everybody's going there. So getting back to the children that were found, and there will be many others. I enlighten these children to pure light, and their voices are being heard. And we're asked to pray for souls, and particularly pure souls. What can be more pure than a child? So I'm, I'm really encouraging my friends, I'm encouraging you as my family to offer prayers for these little ones and ask them to bring about unity in Canada between all of our different communities, no matter what your nationality is and bring a calm to the people who, of course, are quite angered by this situation. We must pay attention to love. How do you love someone, someone you don't know? It's something we can do. You know, I've, I've talked to many people there saying, I don't know what to do. I said, can you pray? Oh, yes. I said, well, pray. If that's all you can do, it is something. It is a very powerful thing. And the prayers of children are even stronger. So as we know, love gives life to the lifeless. Love lights a flame with the heart that is cold. Love brings hope to the hopeless and gladdens the hearts of the sorrowful. In the world of existence, there is indeed no greater power than the power of love. So that's something that can be also done. That is very tangible. It's, it's, it's real when you send out love to those people. And getting back to the tablets of the divine plan, where Abdu Baha makes reference to the indigenous people, it's becoming more clear to me now, where he indicates should these original people, indigenous people be educated and properly guided that they would illumine the world. What does that mean? Does that mean unity? I think so. I think that by creating this, this light, this light that holds no barriers between individuals, between races, between different levels of uh, existence in the world, that's light. And to know and acknowledge that within the indigenous teachings, it's about oneness. Although you go from culture to culture, there is a little variation. But in all my life, and I've been around for seven decades, this is the main, main teaching is oneness, that we're all human. Every one of us here on the screen is a human. So there's one, one human species. So what else did Abdul Baha say? I'm sure that many of the children's classes, when there's a lot of excitement, at least when I was, was teaching children's class, I said, okay, children, be calm, be strong, be a lamp full of light and just have them practice on how do you be calm? What does that look like? So when you're calm, how are you breathing? When you have a calm disposition, nothing can shake you. Nothing. 
So one of the things I wanted to do tonight is to share a story. And this is a story of Abdul Baha. We've made it um, a point in our, in our community that at each feast we would share stories of Abdul Baha. And I want to share this story of Abdul Baha uh, at a time when he was only seven years old. As I know that many of these children whose remains have been found were very young children. Now I never I never heard of this story before, and I just recently found it. You know how it is when you find a new story about Abdul Baha or one of the people in the, from the early days. So this story was um, let's see how. Yeah. It says, while on pilgrimage in Karbila, where he remains for 10 months between 1851 and 1852, Baha'u'llah sends Abdul Baha. He sends Abdul Baha, then only a child of seven and a half years old, on a critical mission to deliver a sensitive message to the Mirza Taki Khan the Amir Nizam or general of the Persian army, about 50 kilometers away from Tehran. He's sending a seven and a half year old boy, his son, the delight of his life, whom he called when he was so little, he called him master. So he's gonna send him to this general. Nothing is known about this confidential mission. Nobody knows and the urgent circumstances surrounding the event. But it is without a doubt that Abdul Bahabai, the servant of Baha'u'llah's household and trusted to accompany the young Abdul Baha on this mission had strict instructions to bring the child home without delay. So he was requested to take Abdul Baha there for him to deliver the message and to bring Abdul Baha immediately home. Now, one day in early winter, Abdul Baha Bey mounts his horse. So this is in the winter. And, his, and then he lifts Abdul Baha up before him in the saddle. The 50 kilometers separating them from the army are covered at great speed without stopping once for rest or refreshment. Once at the garrison, Abdul Baha is immediately brought before the Mustafawi Mal Mamalik, who shows him great respect and consideration. Then he introduces him to the Amir Nisam, the general of the army. Mirza Taki Khan, who inquires as to the nature of Abdul Baha's mission, Abdul Baha then conveys the message of Baha'u'llah, his father. The general listens very attentively, weighing the words of Abdul Baha. Then he issues orders based on the information that has been conveyed to him. The Amr Nassam invites Abdul Baha to remain in the camp overnight and return to Tehran the next morning. Sufficiently rested and refreshed, and it is at this point that Abdul Baha Bey whisks Abdul Baha back to Tehran the same day, as he was asked to do, as he was actually requested to do. Abdul Baha remembers these events clearly, and this is Abdul Baha who will be speaking now. He said, Abdul Baha Bey, however, hearing of the successful conference with the general and wishing the good news to reach my family as soon as possible resorted to a stratagem to leave the garrison at once. Knowing my love for nature, Abdul Baha's love for nature, because he really loved nature, and the country, he came to me, he said, little master, I know a lovely village not very far away. Why should you remain in this smoky camp? Let us go to this hamlet. It has many lovely gardens, 
fruit trees, flowers, and the climate is exhilarating in the extreme. So this is what Abdu'l-Bahá remembered. Now the young child in front of such enthusiasm for what sounds like an extraordinary place, he wants to go there, right? He yields to Abdul Wahab, who scoops up Abdul Baha again in front of his saddle, then proceeds to the last, to the last, the horse mercilessly to Tehran. So he's riding very fast again back to Tehran. Abdul Baha asks Abdul Wahab once in a while about the hamlet. Remember the hamlet he referred to? He, he asked him about it, but he doesn't answer him. Pretty soon, after hours of racing, Abdul Baha sees the familiar skyline of Tehran. He's too tired to protest by that time, having missed the heavenly village. Upon arrival, Abdul Baha is carried into the house, asleep and numbed by the cold. He's laid to rest near the fireplace until the circulation in his limbs is restored. The mission took a grave toll on Abdu'l Baha, upon his health, and he himself testifies to this. He said, that night and the following day, I could eat nothing. And for more than two weeks, I was like a child whose sensitive organs and bones had been crushed to pieces. And that was, Abdu'l Baha quoted this to Mirza Ahmad Sarab in his diary in 1913. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful story. And I was thinking to myself, we always ask the children to look to Abdu'l Baha as that perfect example. And for all of us to also look to him as a perfect example. And how do we live in the world? How do we be? What does he say? Follow me. That's what we have to do. So I was thinking again, how do, how do you remain calm without prayer? And how do you share prayers with others? I'm sure that all of you, because we've all been challenged to have increased our devotional gatherings, increase our um, home visits by via phone, via Zoom, whatever capacity we have in technologies to share prayers with each other. We certainly do need those. Now, I was also um, remembering that because Abdul Baha is the perfect example, that there must be some qualities that he wants us to acquire or to sharpen up. So <clears throat> he said, he tells us, you know, all of these trials that we're going through now in the world, not just in Canada, but all over the world, these are, these are difficult, they're hard, so much hardship, so much sadness, and, and this isolation, all of these things are going on. But they are part of progress. Remember before I said, you know, we have to look at even the desperate things as having light. It's kind of removing some of the tarnish, perhaps, or opening the door in which we see our tests as ways of getting stronger. So he talks about this and that we must look at our anguish with joy. When we're sad, we have to become joyful that we are facing sadness in our lives. I know it's hard. It's very hard for me. I know that I shed a lot of tears when I hear this news. But also, uh, Abdu'l Baha said, under all conditions, he said, is, he said to us, I am your solace. I am your support. 
that always gives me such comfort, that calms me when I realize that Abdu Baha is there for me, for you, for all of us. And he said, for those who aspire to a lasting change, he's our guide. In which way does he guide? He's very tactful and wise. In anything that he approached, he was always very tactful. So that's what we have to also become more tactful, more wise in our approach in our lives. And this will last, will be a lasting change. Once that becomes the way in which we live, this will be good. So this being tactful and wise in our approach. And also he, he said that we have to be penetrating in our utterance. What does that mean? That means we can't be quiet. Being tactful and wise, but we have to, in our words, they have to be penetrating. They can't be kind of wishy-washy. You know, the National Spiritual Assembly has asked us to double our efforts. So we have to learn how to be penetrating in our, in our words and our approach. He said, we have to be indiscriminating in our fellowship. So for a moment, think to yourself, how many here have the opportunity to get to know Indigenous people? And if you cannot, Think how you can. I was thinking to myself, how many of the arts Indigenous people are involved in today? Whereas even 30 years ago, there were so few world-renowned artists. So everywhere in the arts, in the field of education, in the field of science. Indigenous people are in all of those fields that Abdul Baha talked about. Should they become educated? So indigenous people are in all fields of education now, in universities, in places of higher learning. So if you are searching for friendship with indigenous people, I said to some other people I was talking talking with, I said, they're everywhere. They might even be your neighbors. <laughs> and we're asked to reach out to our neighborhood. So I encourage you for that. We must be also, he said to us, in order to remain calm, we must be unfailing in our sympathy for the downtrodden. unfailing in our sympathy for the downtrodden. I know that during COVID, this has been quite, quite difficult for us. If you can't go to places where these people are, but certainly, and I can see many wonderful cooks there, wonderful uh, chefs, people that know how to prepare food to give to the downtrodden. He encourages us to do that. Courageous in our conduct, persevering in our actions. So if we say we're going to do something, we must do it. That's a, that's a pretty good way in which you can remain calm. If you make a promise, you become very calm after you fulfill the promise. That's another area. Imperturbable in the face of tests. That's a hard one for me. I find it's very, sometimes you cannot find a solution for some of your tests, but you have to keep on. And the last one, which I'm sure all of you have been thinking about, is unwavering in our keen sense of justice. What is justice? You know, every, everybody's trying to think about what is the just thing to do? What is justice? 
Well, the purpose of justice is to attain unity. So that means that there can't be, there can't be this fighting going on. The purpose of justice is to attain unity. Baha'u'llah tells us that. So how do we create unity? Every one of us has this opportunity to provide this gift of unity. So those are some of the things I was thinking about. And Baha'u'llah tells us also in this day, he assures us, he said, peerless in this day, for it is as a, the eye to the past ages and centuries and as a light unto the darkness of the times. In this perspective, the issue is not the darkness that slowed and obscured the progress achieved in the extraordinary hundred years now ending. It is rather how much more suffering and ruin must be experienced by our race. It doesn't refer to what race, but I refer to my race as being part of it. Before we wholeheartedly accept the spiritual nature that makes us a single people and gather the courage to plan our future in the light of what has been so painfully learned. So with all of this, friends, we are doing it. I don't want to say we can do it. We are. Whoever is cognizant, whoever is conscientious of what has occurred in the indigenous population of Canada, you're cognizant of what happened and, and what you can do. What can you do? So I suppose you can study what's going on, become more aware, consult with your family, have a little action, what you can bring about, reflect on that action. What else can I do? So I just wanted to um, end this part and be open to Q's and A's. And I, I always like to say this as a, as a proviso, I guess, is that I'll only answer the questions that I can. I cannot answer questions that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> um, so uh, I wanted uh, Farouz to just show you, you know, when I heard about this, I had such a heavy heart and I probably cried for two days and Bob said, you know, we have to do something. I said, yes, we should have a ceremony. So what we created, we wanted to have a sacred fire outside. So we have a fireplace. So I lit, we lit the fire pit. Bob was in charge of the fire. We took um, red duct tape and we made a nine pointed star. And I have all these beautiful river stones, which I had just washed and polished because they are in our, you know, when I, we come into our porch, we put our boots there in the winter, but I wash them every season. I wash and I polish them because they've done such a good job. So I'm respecting all these stones. And I collected uh, 24 for each of the eight, here they go, for each of the eight uh, points of the star and then 23 for one of them. So this is the fire. And this is uh, prior to us. And there were eight people there. And Bob and I counted as the, as the one bubble. And my girlfriend and I, we drummed. Each person would come to the chevron where there was a pile of stones. And at the beat of the drum, you can go back. And go back to the other ones, yeah. So to the beat of a drum, this is my friend here. She's, uh, it's gone to another picture now. So what we did to the beat of the drum, all the friends that were present, the eight friends, and including Bob, 
put stones on those chevrons, representing 215 beautiful, pure souls who's left this world. I think there's a couple more pictures. There's that one. This is my friend. So this is after all the stones were laid, as you can see on the, the chevrons. And each person that was came to put the stones on, they were given tobacco and they put the tobacco into the fire. And this was a little special ceremony that we had for the children and their relatives. And the big stones at the top represent the grandfathers. So this represents the earth itself and how the earth helps us to heal. I think there's one more picture, is there not? No, oh, that's Molly. Molly was the instigator. Yeah. So that's what we did in our community. At the time, they had just opened up the, the bridge and they also opened it up so we could have eight people out on our, in our front yard or in our yard to do these special, like a meal together or some kind of social activity together. So thank you for coming to that little ceremony. We had a, we feasted afterwards and then as ceremonies in indigenous community, it's always followed by a little feast where you have to feed the people who have participated in this little feast. It's like our 19 day feast. We come for the prayers, we socialize, we're there for a particular quality of God, whatever the month is, this month is a month of mercy. Yeah. So thank you. Masi, Masi Cho. I'll try and, if there's any questions, I'll try and answer them. Thank you. Um, now I, I uh, leave uh, the floor open for, uh, please, dear friends, if you have uh, any questions uh, that you'd like to 